Hello everyone and welcome to the weird, scary and horrible parts of humanity. Today we are looking at the execution of British American citizen Nicholas Ingram in 1995, who was executed for murder and attempted murder. Ingram was the last Briton to be executed in the 20th century and only one of a handful of Brits to be executed following Britain's last execution when Peter Anthony Allen and Gwyn Owen Evans were executed on the 13th of August 1964. Ingram was born in Cambridge in the United Kingdom on the 20th of November 1963. The son of British citizen Anne Ingram and American Johnny Ingram. He allegedly had undefined psychiatric problems which came to light during his appeals against the death penalty. His father was a United States Armed Forces Airman and when Ingram was aged 11, he moved with his parents to Cobb County in Georgia, located in the Atlanta metropolitan area. However, upon the family returning to the United States of America, his parents' marriage disintegrated and Ingram lived with his father in Cobb County. As a teenager, Ingram got into drugs and alcohol and turned to a life of crime. Having gone to jail, he was released in May 1983 at the age of 19. On the 3rd of June 1983, Ingram went with his friend Kevin Plummer in Plummer's car to sell automobile wheels and a ring at a pawn shop before going to see Ingram's friend who worked at a convenience store. They then drove to his father's house where Ingram retrieved a pearl-handled .38 revolver. Ingram then took LSD, smoked weed and got drunk. He told Plummer that he knew where he could get a vehicle that he was going to use to drive to California. Ingram directed Plummer to a driveway that led through the woods and up Blackjack Mountain. At approximately 6.30pm, armed with his father's pearl-handled gun, the pair arrived at the driveway to the log cabin home of 55-year-old retired military veteran J.C. Sawyer, who lived in Georgia with his wife, Mary Sawyer. They had one child, Kenneth Mark Sawyer, who did not live with them. Ingram told Plummer to wait and said that he might have to pistol whip the occupants, but wasn't sure that he could shoot them. He then walked up the driveway and Plummer decided not to wait and drove home. Home. Mary Sawyer answered the door and was pushed past by Ingram who produced the gun and stated get back in the house or I'll blow your heads off. Ingram demanded the use of their phone and said that he wanted money and the keys to JC Sawyer's blue and white Chevrolet pickup truck. Ingram fired a warning shot through the floor of the living room to prove that his gun was not a toy and threatened to blow the heads of the Sawyers off if they did not adhere to his demands. Mary Sawyer gave him $60 while JC Sawyer gave Gave him the keys to his blue and white Chevrolet pickup truck. Ingram marched them outside and into the woods around their home. Using rope, he tied the hands of the Sawyers behind them and to a tree. Ingram told Mary Sawyer to remember a tattoo that she noticed on his arm because it was going to get her killed. The Sawyers implored for their lives, but it came to nothing, with Ingram bragging that he liked to torture people, stating, I like to torture men while their women watch. It will take two to three days for your bodies to be found, and if any of your family finds any evidence to convict me, the most I'll ever get is 30 years, and I'll come back and get them. He threatened them for half an hour. He then took his shirt off, tore it in two, and stuffed one half into each of their mouths before shooting at them both. J.C. Sawyer would die instantly while Mary Sawyer survived with the bullet grazing her head. Hearing the truck drive off, Mary Sawyer went to her neighbor's house who called police. Meanwhile, Ingram showed up at the convenience store at 8pm, which he had been to earlier on the 3rd of June 1983. Driving the Sawyer's truck, the abandoned truck was recovered three days later on the 6th of June 1983 on Interstate 20 in Mississippi. Inside the truck was a motel receipt from Lincoln, Alabama, which was dated the 3rd of June 1983. Police went to the hotel and from the motel's proportion of a receipt, they linked the handwriting to that of Ingram. Having made his way to California, he stole another vehicle and drove to Nebraska, where he was arrested for a DUI. While being questioned about the stolen car, even though police at the time had no linkage of Ingram to J.C. Sawyer's murder, he told Nebraskan police that he could save some time and asked that if they checked with Cobb County that they would find that he was wanted for two murders. Questioning of Ingram was immediately stopped until Georgian authorities were contacted. 
Ingram was then returned from Nebraska to Atlanta, Georgia. There he gave a statement to police confessing to the murder of J.C. Sawyer and the attempted murder of Mary Sawyer. However, he stated that he woke up on the 4th of June 1983 in a shopping center car park in a truck in Alabama and contended that he had blacked out from drinking and could not remember shooting or robbing anyone. Mary Sawyer was able to pick Ingram out of a lineup. In his 1983 trial, his lawyers claimed that Ingram was not the murderer of Sawyer, with no fingerprints of Ingram's found at the site of the murder. Mary Sawyer's description of her attacker also did not match Ingram, and his clothes bore no resemblance of violence or bloodstains. Ingram was convicted of the murder of J.C. Sawyer and sentenced to death by electric chair on his 20th birthday on the 20th of November 1983. He was held at the Jackson State Prison as part of the Georgia Diagnostic Classification Center. However, in an appeal by his lawyer, Clive Stafford Smith, Smith argued that during his initial trial, Ingram was heavily drugged and medicated by prison officials before his 1983 trial and was also unable to brief his defense lawyers. Then Republican Attorney General of Georgia Michael Bowers rejected these claims and District Judge Horace Ward dismissed the pleas by Ingram's lawyers for a new hearing to examine alleged evidence that he was drugged at his trial in 1983 and unable to brief his defense lawyers. In total over 12 years there were 15 legal reviews. His death sentence provoked a strong interest in British media with pleas for clemency, including from 52 members of Parliament, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Dr George Curry, who personally wrote to Georgia's Governor, Democrat Zell Miller, as well as five members of Georgia's Board of Pardons and Paroles, with Dr Curry pleading for Ingram's life to be saved. There were also pleased some charities, including Amnesty International, as well as the President of the European Parliament, Klaus Hunch, with the United Kingdom at the time, a member of the European Union. However, someone who did not extend this sympathy or case for clemency was Conservative Prime Minister John Major, who refused to intervene. A letter was delivered to Prime Minister Major by Anne Ingram while he was visiting Washington, D.C., with Ingram imploring for him to intervene and for him to assist in saving her son's life. She attempted to meet with Major on the 3rd of April 1995 at the British Embassy in Washington, D.C., having flown from Ackworth, Georgia, to Washington, D.C., but before she arrived, Prime Minister Major had told reporters that he would not see her. Prime Minister Major stated, I gave it long and careful thought. I understand fully the very deep stress she is suffering, but I do not think there is anything further we can do. British political counsellor, Peter Westmacott insisted that there was no basis for the British government to intervene in the case. Anne Ingram left the British Embassy hurt but still hopeful. At the time, Ingram's execution was to proceed three days later on the 6th of April 1995. In a handwritten response to Anne Ingram, Prime Minister Major wrote, I found your letter very moving and I can imagine the profound distress you must be feeling, but I have concluded with deepest regret that there are no proper grounds for the British government to intervene with the state of Georgia. This was despite Prime Minister Major's predecessor, Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, intervening unsuccessfully in an attempt to save the lives of British citizen Kevin Barlow and British citizen Derek Gregory in Malaysia for smuggling heroin out of Malaysia. By the way, we did videos on the execution of Kevin Barlow and Brian Jeffrey Chambers, as well as the execution of Derek Gregory, so don't forget to check those videos out. Speaking to the British media while in Washington, D.C., Anne Ingram claimed that she had evidence that someone else was responsible for the murder of Sawyer and that Ingram was drugged during his initial trial in 1983. However, the evidence of someone else murdering Sawyer never came to fruition. She also stated regarding her son, he is getting scared. He is very scared. He can see the times running out for him. But having said that, he is optimistic. During an appeal, the Georgia Pardons Board interviewed Mary Sawyer, who told the board that she believed that Ingram deserved to be executed, stating, We begged for mercy and we were given none. He was a judge, jury and executioner, all in a matter of minutes. He certainly didn't intend for me to live.
During the two-hour hearing, Ingram's lawyer argued that another participant in the crime was responsible for the murder of Sawyer, reiterating that Ingram was drugged during his trial in 1983 and noted that electrocution was a cruel and unusual punishment, with several other states in the United States of America having adopted lethal injection as a more humane method of execution. However, this final appeal was not successful and Ingram's execution was finalised to take place as of the 7th of April 1995. British telecom operators were inundated with calls from people wanting to ring the Jackson State Prison and ask for Ingram's execution to be halted. With his execution approaching in an open letter to the British people published in London newspapers, Ingram thanked those who appealed on his behalf and stated, If I die, I hope it's not for nothing. I hope people will see that a ritualistic killing in the electric chair solves nothing. For breakfast, Ingram had eggs and grits, but declined a final meal. But later on, he did eat some biscuits and chips bought by relatives from a prison vending machine. Eight hours before his execution at 1pm, with his head shaved as well as his legs shaved and wearing a baseball cap, he saw his parents one last time. He wore the baseball cap so that they would not have to see his bald head, with his head and legs shaved to prepare him for George's electric chair, Old Sparky. He asked his parents not to attend his execution. Anne Ingram described her son's fate as disgusting and barbaric, and a family representative noted that life imprisonment would have been sufficient, and that they expressed gratitude towards the Sawyer family, who never expressed hate or revenge with the family representative, noting that Georgia could use more families like that. Ingram was described as angry and irritable while held in a cell adjacent to Old Sparky. However, an appeal was granted by Federal District Judge Horace Ward, based in Atlanta, Georgia, for a 72-hour stay of execution for Ingram at 5.55 p.m. Ingram was not noted of this until his lawyers rang the prison and broke the news to him at 6.35 p.m. Ingram was described as cocky and confident after this was granted. However, Georgia's Attorney General Michael Bowers immediately appealed for this appeal to be overturned and within a few hours the Court of Appeals in Atlanta ruled that the execution of Ingram should go ahead, with the US Supreme Court denying two further requests for a stay of execution and Supreme Court spokeswoman Tony House stating that none of the nine High Court Justices voted to hear the pleas of Ingram's lawyers. On hearing the news that his execution was to go ahead, Ingram was described as quiet and stone-faced and spent much of the rest of the time drinking coffee. Meeting with Smith, he expressed his total and utter contempt for the whole system of killing. Smith would tell British and American media outlets outside the jail that what they were going to do was utterly, utterly barbaric. A small group of opponents of the death penalty prayed outside the prison in the lead up to his execution. At 9.06pm, he walked defiantly to Old Sparky. The prison warden, Albert Thomas, known as Jerry, asked Ingram if he had any last words, to which Ingram spat in the face of Thomas. Two chaplains and officials from George's prison service were with Ingram in the execution chamber, while six media representatives as well as two people chosen by Ingram. Smith and his ex-girlfriend Tammy Rose witnessed his execution on Old Sparky. When he asked if he wished to make a last statement, Ingram simply replied, let's get on with it, and he had a penetrating glaze towards the witnesses. At 9.06pm, Old Sparky was turned on and the current passed through Ingram's body. He was pronounced dead at 9.15pm. When his body was taken out on a black hearse, there were bursts of cheers and taunts from pro-capital punishment advocates, with one shouting, Yeah, Nicky, you got what you had coming. Smith would state he wasn't the only person who was getting hurt here. It was his family, and he asked me to say he had written a letter to the Sawyers, and please not to harass his family anymore. He wanted to look forward to another life, so he could look out for something better than what had happened in this life, which had been so sad. 
However, Attorney General Bowers stated that he was only sorry that the execution of Ingram had not been carried out sooner and stated that Ingram deserved to die. By this stage, Sawyer had remarried and was with her second husband and family 50 miles away at the time of Ingram's execution. She was disappointed that he had not repented and had not apologised for the murder of her ex-husband before his execution. Ingram's father, Johnny Ingram, stated, well, he's dead now, and they can't hurt him no more. Anne Ingram stated, There's nothing to be said. It has happened, and nothing's going to bring him back. Now we must pick up the pieces of our lives. Dr. George Kerry stated that he held the deepest regret for Ingram's execution, telling BBC Radio, It seems such an awful thing, and particularly the long wait. This seems so cruel. J.C. Sawyer is buried at the Sandy Plains Cemetery South in Marietta Cobb County. His son, Kenneth Mark Sawyer, died at the age of 54 on the 11th of July 2012. Thank you for watching. Please do yourself a favour and hit that subscribe button and the bell icon to inform yourself of when new videos come out. It helps more than you know and your support is truly appreciated. Until next time, stay awesome, stay classy, be kind to everyone you meet, have an amazing day and remember the truth is always more interesting than fiction.